going to start. So, um, I'm going to be talking in this lecture about polynomial approximation. Um, so, I'm going to move off track of uh, uh, the quantum algorithm stuff that we were talking about before. And the reason why I'm talking about this is sort of uh, we established before, or hopefully I established to you, um, that you could get from um, using your quantum algorithms, um, you could get from block encodings of some matrix A to a block encoding of a matrix um, that's this polynomial applied to A. And roughly speaking, like if this uh, if this was like a Q Q block encoding, meaning that the gate complexity is Q, then this turned into like a DQ, sorry, NQ, NQ block encoding of P, where N is the degree of P. And so, provided that uh, you know, I, I want to implement some some like low degree polynomial. Um, and you need P to be bounded, then we could do this efficiently with our uh, QSVT protocol. And the issue is that normally, like for a lot of the applications that we want, we're actually wanting to apply non-polynomial functions. So um, in this Hamiltonian simulation um, example, we wanted to apply this function from H to E to the minus IHT this was not a polynomial. Similarly, there's like another example, which is this um, linear regression. Um, the f there's a linear regression algorithm um, that's sort of central to um, quantum machine learning, and this takes the this performs the map A to A inverse when A is some sparse matrix. And so if you think about what this is applying, this is just applying the function that's 1 over x. And so, you know, in this, these instances, it's like we, we, these are not polynomials. And so you're going to have to work a little bit harder to um, find polynomials that approximate them. So I'm going to, in this lecture, I'm just going to be discussing how can you take a function and then get a polynomial out of it. Um, and... Um, yeah, so our tool for doing this will be Chebyshev polynomials. And basically, you can do this, use these Chebyshev polynomials to get any sort of approximation that you might want, um, up to some details of actually just the computation of working things out. OK. Um, yes. Um, yes, so there are more simple ways to see this and more uh, complicated ways that are more efficient. Um, the simple thing is to say that your Hamiltonian is a linear combination of unitaries. So here, these polys are unitaries. There's another approach that basically goes any S sparse matrix you can um, you can implement in like S with like an, uh, you can implement like, so this allows you to implement like H over the sum of lambda A. There's another approach that's like, if you have S that's like H that's S sparse, that you can get a block encoding of like H over S, or like all the entries are bounded by one. And this is, I think the argument is basically that just that you somehow decompose it into polys in a, in a sufficiently nice way. Um, yeah. Are there any, any other questions um, about like why I'm doing polynomial approximation or anything else? OK. So I'm going to give a bunch of theory of Chebyshev polynomials. 
And what they are, how I'm going to define them, is that um, the degree n Chebyshev polynomial, which is called Tn, is um, it's the function that satisfies um, for all complex z um, this equation. And OK, so this is how it's defined. Um, from this definition, you might ask, why is this a polynomial? Um, well, you can see that this is a polynomial um, by observing that it satisfies this recurrence relation. And yeah, so this you know, what you can do to see this is you can plug in um, your value of x, and then you can see that um, your, this, this recurrence basically becomes the following, which is um, um, These are this is a these are twos. That's I don't know if I can continue doing this uh <laughs> um yeah, hopefully I'll keep this in mind <laughs> that these two are similar. Um right, so um this recurrence I wrote is equivalent to this equation where you can just check that this is true. And furthermore, um, you can see that t0 is equal to 1, and t1 is equal to x. Um, like t1 of x, yeah. Um, OK. And. So from this, you can conclude that all of the Chebyshev polynomials are, are, are indeed polynomials from this definition. Um, OK. Um, if we plug in, um, if we take z to be equal to 1 half, uh, sorry, if we take z to be something on the complex unit circle, then this 1 half z plus z inverse is equal to cosine of the angle. It's like the real part. And so you get a, more f a definition that might be more familiar to you, which is that uh, Chebyshev polynomial applied to, apply to cosine theta is cosine n theta. And from this, you can conclude that, OK, first of all, um, OK, is this possible to see? Um, yeah, from this you can conclude that um, Tn of x is bounded by 1 for all x in minus 1, 1. Um, I'm going to start abbreviating this by saying Tn minus 1, 1 is bounded by 1. Um, I'm just going to use this notation to refer to the above. Um, and the reason for this is like for any x in minus 1, 1, it, there's a corresponding cosine theta, um, or cor corresponding real theta, such that this is cosine theta is equal to x. And therefore, cosine n theta will be between minus 1 and 1. Um, Another thing you can observe is that um, uh, Tn has parity n. Um, so um, you can see this from the recursion um, that if 
TN is that that your uh, T one is odd, T two is even, T three is odd, and so on. Um, okay. Right. So the property for of Chebyshev polynomials that'll be important for us is that. Um, Basically, that any um, sufficiently uh, nice function from minus one, one to the reals um, can be written in terms of Chebyshev polyno polynomials um, in this way as a series of polynomials. So k from 0 to infinity of a k t k of x, where um, these um, these a k's are like absolutely or like they're absolutely converging, um, and um, sufficiently nice here is a very mild restriction. I think what you need is like some Lipschitz continuity. Um, so basically, you just need that, um, like sort of the derivative of f is always not is always finite, or is finite is it has a upper bound between minus one and one. Yeah. Um, and the reason for this is um, for the same reason that you can have like Fourier series of functions. Um, and in fact, there is like essentially uh, parallel theories um, because if you have this function f from minus one one to r, you can define another function um, g, which is I guess from the unit circle to r by saying that g of um, z is equal to f of um, like the real part of z. And so by, um, if f of x has a decomposition into Chebyshev polynomials, then g will have a decomposition of the form, I'm plugging in the value, the, the, the series here, so it's a k t k of 1 half z plus c inverse which is the sum from, it's a sum over z to the k and z to the minus k. Um, and the um, thing to note is that this is like a Laurent series. These are like Laurent um, series. And furthermore, you can say, you can define um, some, let's get another color. You can define some h from minus pi pi to r by saying that uh, it's equal to um, by taking the corresponding angle of G, uh, uh, the corresponding, so applying G to the um, value on the unit circle with the corresponding angle. And then you'll get that this is equal to K from zero to infinity of, um, what is it here? It's E to the I K theta plus E to the I minus I K theta. And these are Fourier series for um, h, which is a 2 pi periodic function. And so what I'm going to do later is I'm going to um, show properties that these ak's are decaying, and so you can like truncate them to, to, to get polynomials. Um, but just keep in mind that there are these like three parallel theories. So if you have intuition from like Fourier analysis or, or any other of these, there's sort of parallel statements for all three of them. Um, OK. So that's what I wanted to say on that. 
Um, and so from, from these theories, you might um, suspect such a thing, but there is um, an orthogonality property that these Chebyshev polynomials satisfy, um, which is that uh, these are orthogonal um, under some inner product. Um, and I'll just say, like, I'll just write down what the, what the equation I want to say is. Um, so here, this is the inner product. Um, so if I have two functions, tk and tl, then I'm taking their inner product to be this integral. Um, and I'm saying that this is orthogonal under this inner product, which means that this is going to be, I guess, I guess orthonormal. Um, but it's going to be 1 if k is equal to L um, and 0 otherwise. And I think you might need, it actually, I think it evaluates to 2 if k equals L equals 0. So there's some, like, slight, um, there's, like, some slight uh, issue. So there's always some slight constant things that happen at 0, but... Um, basically, they're all um, orthogonal. Okay, how you can see this is you can say, I'm just going to take this and I'm going to substitute. I'm going to do a u substitution. x equals cosine theta, and then dx equals minus sine theta d theta. And then what happens is that my integral becomes 2 over pi. Um, I think this goes now from pi to 0, tk of cosine theta, tl of sine theta of cosine theta. And um, square root of 1 minus cosine squared is sine squared, or sine. So this is uh, sine theta. Am I off by some thing here? There's, sorry? That's true. Okay. I'm worried about this absolute value. There might, is there some absolute value here that I'm... I don't think so. I think we're fine. Yeah, okay. Um... <coughs> All right, so this is integral from 0 to pi of, uh, this is tk of cosine theta. By what I said before, this is cosine of k theta, and this is cosine of l theta. Yes. And, okay, I'm going to leave it as an exercise to show that this is, this is equal to, um, this is equal to 1 when k is equal to l and then zero otherwise. Um, you can get this with a cosine um, addition formula. Um, OK. Um, yeah, any questions on this? Um, the form of the inner product is like, um, yeah, the way that you should think about these polynomials is that they're sort of like, they belong on the unit complex circle, and, um, and so that's why you get these terms of like, square root of 1 minus x squared, which is like, um, like if you, if you were working with these on like the, the complex unit circle, then these terms would disappear, and then these would become like polynomials in Z. Um, or I guess Laurent polynomials in Z. Um, another way you could think about it is that like, um, um, 
another way you can think about it is that this inner product is like the normal inner product, except when your function is near minus one or one, in which case things start to get strange, or like they're um, sort of things are more heavily weighted. Um, and then this is a behavior of Chebyshev polynomials that's like common that you'll see in other places as well. Um, I hope that's helpful. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. So the nice thing about this uh, orthogonality property is now you can like actually take a function and then figure out what its Chebyshev coefficients are, right? Because if I have some f of x that's written as this uh, sum, this Chebyshev series then I could imagine I integrate this against um, some, I, I use this integration uh, inner product thing, and I take the inner product with tk, and this will give, give me the value at uh, the coefficient at tk. Right, so if I take this in inner product, um, tk of x, Then what is this? This is like some sum. Um, I'm interchanging the, um, the sum and the integral, so don't get mad. Hello, hello. Okay. okay. Um, great. Okay. So, as I was saying before, if we have some uh, function with a Chebyshev series, we can figure out which, um, which coefficient. We can figure out coefficients via this integral, right? Because we can take the inner product with tk, and then we get this um, sum. And then this expression um, is the integral we evaluated before, which is 1 whenever l is equal to k, I guess out here. And so, um, you get that this is equal to ak. Okay, so you know if you have this integral here, um, if you compute this integral here, you can get the value of ak. Um, now, I don't recommend doing this computationally because it's. Um, I, I think it's not. I think it's not the best way, but um, any in any case. Um, so one thing, but we can, from this we can conclude a lot of useful properties about these um, Chebyshev coefficients. Um, for example, like something that we can conclude um, is that if my function f is bounded, then um, it turns out my Chebyshev coefficients are bounded. So here I'm just writing um, I'm just writing what my value of ak is. Um, okay, what can I do? I can then bound this 
by, I take the norm of f in here, I take the norm of tk in here, and then I, and I, this is still 1 over uh, 1 minus x squared, and this is equal to 2 over pi times 1 o the integral of 1 over root 1 minus x squared. Um, and if you believe me, this is just pi, so the value is 2. Okay. So I've just shown that for all of my, uh, for my Chebyshev series, then all, if my function is bounded, then the coefficients are bounded. Um, and this is one reason why you see it all the time in um, these, these polynomials all the time in applied math. Um, because this is different from what happens in the monomial basis. So, um, like, for example, you can have polynomials like the Chebyshev polynomial, where your Chebyshev polynomial is, is bounded, um, but if you write it in the monomial basis, this is like the first, the leading term here is 2 to the n minus 1, x to the n plus, like all of the coefficients are exponentially large in the degree. And so you get some instability, which is why these, it's better to work in the Chebyshev basis where things are more stable. Um, okay, so this is why this is sort of, uh, starts to suggest the reasons why we're looking at these. Um, Okay, so the main kind of polynomial approximation we're going to be looking at is that of um, Chebyshev truncation. So if we have some function minus 1, 1 to r, um, and it has a Chebyshev series, um, And we can find this truncation to be just we take all of the coefficients up to n. Um, and this will be our degree n approximation to f. And well, you could ask how well does this do? Um, and we can measure it, we can, we can see how well it does in like the uniform, and it's like a norm that like uh, point-wise. So how poorly this approximates, well, since it comes from the Chebyshev series, um, we just need to bound the tail. As we said before, all of these TKs were bounded by one. And so you can bound this by k equals n plus 1. Okay. You can bound this by the sum of the tail of the Chebyshev, the, the Chebyshev coefficient tail. And this is sort of what um, our goal is to bound, right? Because we know that for our series, this does converge. And then maybe if we choose n sufficiently large, then this bound will be like, um, like, okay, because we know that um, this, because we know that the whole sum series of um, AKs converge, we can choose n large enough so that this is epsilon. And this will give us a Chebyshev uh, polynomial approximation that's good up to epsilon. Um, right, so basically all I'm saying is that we want this to be epsilon. And like, um, right, our, our broad vision here is that, um, our broad vision here is that if we have some um, A, and then we want to apply some F of A, but we can actually only apply Fn of A, like this polynomial, then, then using this argument, we can show that um, how much we're off by in operator norm is bounded by epsilon. Um, 
yeah, so, so that's like the, the high level viewpoint from like the quantum algorithms perspective. Okay, um, so we want to show that these AKs are decaying. Um, there's a bunch of theorems that basically state something of the following form, which is that the smoother that your function f is, the faster that these Chebyshev coefficients decay. Um, so for example, there's like these Jackson theorems which say that if I am like singly differentiable, then, uh, or if, if my first derivative is bounded, then my um, tail, then these AKs decay is like one over K squared. If they're doubly uh, differentiable, then they, they decay as like K cubed. And the nice thing is that you don't really need to like try to get a handle on like what explicitly computing these coefficients, which can be difficult. Um, so I'm gonna prove a statement of this form, um, which is that, um, okay, this is a theorem, comes from a book of um, Trefethen. And what this is is um, if, if f is a function um, and it's analytic and it's also um, analytically continuable to um, the interior of this ellipse. So how I'm defining this ellipse is going to be um, a little confusing at first, but. Um, and here, it satisfies on this ellipse that f of z, um, yeah, I guess on, uh, and is a, uh, bounded by M on this ellipse. Um, then what we can conclude is that um, our AKs are exponentially decaying. Um, um, yeah, for all K. Okay, so what am I saying here? So, okay, we look at some analytic function. So for example, e to the, e to the x, e to the tx for Hamiltonian simulation. Or um, I can look at um, like other applications. You wanna look at some smooth version of the inverse or you can look at um, uh, some version of arc sine if you rescale it. Um, these are things that appear in like applications of quantum algorithms. Um, and we want it to be continuable to some, this ellipse here, and I'll draw what it looks like. Um, so here is my complex plane. Here's minus one and here's one. Then what my ellipse sort of looks like is it looks like this. And here if um, rho is like one plus delta, then this width here is like delta squared and this width here is like delta. So it's not drawn to size, but. Um, basically the idea is that um, I want my function to be bounded a little bit outside of minus one one. And how far I can go outside, um, and outside of minus one one and still be bounded dictates the rate of convergence. So um, if rho is one plus delta, that means that um, I need my size of my approximation to be like one over delta. Um, right, so like what's going on here is that then we can choose, um, then we can notice that by this theorem, my error is bounded by the sum of these um, AKs, which is like 
bounded by 2m sum. Okay. Right, you have this exponential tail. Um, I'll just write down what the answer is here. I believe this is right. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe it should be an n plus one. Anyways, uh, all this to say that you can choose n to be equal to um, like one over log rho um, log of m over rho minus one epsilon. Uh, if you want this to be bounded by epsilon. So, right, if I can extend to this uh, rho is one plus delta, then I get a one over delta degree approximation. And here, when I say exponential convergence or exponential decay, this will give you a log one over delta term or log, sorry, well, log one over epsilon term here. Um, okay. Um, so, to see where this is coming from, I'm going to prove it. Um, as I wrote before, um, we have this integral Um, for our value of the coefficient. And what I want to do is I want to um, lift it to something on the unit circle. So the way that I do that is I say like x is equal to um, uh, one half z plus z inverse, where like my z is on the unit circle. And if I do this change, what I'll get is that this is equal to, um, let me see. I'm just going to tell you what it is. Um, Um, so I'm integrating around the complex unit circle once in the counterclockwise direction. Um, and here, this is something that you might recognize as like the Cauchy integral formula. Um, and what we can say is that um, we know that f, as we said before, is analytic in some interior of this ellipse, this Bernstein ellipse. And so what I'm going to assert is that we can actually just take this and we can expand our contour to be the contour of the circle of radius the rho. Um, and you'll see that, like, the, th the space that you pass through is space where is the space in the interior of the Bernstein ellipse, and so we can still make this. Uh, so this is an, an equality, and then what we can use is that um, this function here is bounded by m on the ellipse, so it's bounded here as well. Um, and we have that this guy is bounded by um, rho to the minus k plus 1. Is that right? Yeah. And then the length of the contour that we're integrating over is it's a circle of radius rho, so it's 2 pi rho. Um, and so this will give us in total one over, in magnitude, 
This is bounded by 1 over pi times 2 pi rho times rho to the minus k plus 1. And this is precisely what we wanted, this 2 rho to the minus k times m. Okay. Um, okay. Any questions about this? <laughs> Um, right, so this, this um, you might be wondering at this point what the difference is between uh, this like Chebyshev approximation and uh, like a Taylor series approximation. Um, the Taylor series are probably more familiar, um, and then you see them a lot as like the tools they use for doing polynomial approximation. And there is a corresponding statement that you can make here about Taylor series. Um, like, roughly speaking, what you need is that you need your Taylor series coefficients to also be decaying, right? So if you have your, like, um, if you have your, for example, um, like, if your Taylor series coefficients are um, bk, then what you need is, like, bk, I'm going to center it at one, at zero. Um, you need that this guy is bounded by some like m. And you can sort of think about this as saying like, okay, I have my Taylor series approximation or like my Taylor series and then somehow I need to bound it on like a circle, sort of like, um, or I need to, to be bounded. Um, like, and this is like slightly outside of minus one, one, something like this. Um, and so you get, I think you can get similar results. They might not be optimal, but you'll get, you can get like a log one over epsilon convergence. Um, and the main annoyance here is that sometimes you don't have, uh, sometimes you don't want to necessarily go to figuring out what all these coefficients are. And in this case, you can just uh, figure out what this bound is of your function in some region. And this might be easier. Um, so this is just <coughs> trying to explain how this works. Um, so sometimes this isn't enough for us, though. Um, right, as I mentioned before, sometimes we want to approximate functions that are like um, 1 over x. And right, 1 over x is a function that's not bounded in the Bernstein ellipse at all. Um, and you might wonder what we can do here. Um, well, the thing is that we, our, our criteria of what we want to approximate has changed. So this here, if we are trying to apply this to um, a linear system, sort of what we, what we are allowed to say is that um, our matrix that we're performing this on is well conditioned, meaning that none of the singular values uh, go beyond this value, say like delta. And so what we really want to do is we want to approximate it on this region. And then we don't really care what, what happens in this region. We maybe need that it's like bounded between minus one and one, because then we can apply our QSVT. But apart from that, we don't really care what happens. And so in these settings, you, when you have like a different criteria, um, then uh, there's sort of different tools that you need to, you need to sort of massage it into some other form that you can, you can then use. Um, so um, in approximating this particular function, people have been pretty resourceful. Um, so I think there's like um, sort of an ad hoc way to approximate this, which is saying f of x is approximately like 1 minus um, this function. And the idea is that this like 1 minus x squared to the b thing is, um, is going to be setting this to 0, but it's otherwise like, um, sorry, how should I say this? This is like some function 
that's like peaked at, at zero and then decays very fast. And so if you combine these two in such a way, then you'll, you're going to get some function that um, sort of um, bridges this gap in the middle between minus delta and delta. Um, so there are ad hoc ways that you can do this. Um, there are also theorems that basically say, um, that say that you can take some f of x and which is like one over x. And you can um, approximate them on smooth areas and then sort of gloss over areas of discontinuity. So imagine I can do the following, which is I take this um, I can take my function Um, I want to approximate it in this region, outside this region. And imagine I could do the following, which is I have two different functions, and one function performs this approximation, and then it immediately goes to zero, and then it's just zero for the rest of the approximation. And then I can imagine I have another function um, that approximates this negative piece, and then it goes to zero, and then zero for the rest of the um, approximation. Then what I can do is I can sum these two, and then I get my approximation for one over x. That's good on both of these regions. Um, and um, basically, now all you need is some, some way to get a good polynomial approximation but one where it goes to zero outside of the area of approximation. Um, and I'm going to state a theorem and not prove a theorem, um, this theorem that says that you can do this. Um, so if you have f that's, um, it satisfies, um, Okay, yeah, sorry. So <laughs> the way I'm gonna say it is it has the same properties um, and continuable to this Bernstein ellipse, E rho, <coughs> and then bounded by M on this ellipse. Then you can find some um, polynomial approximation um, and it's going to be of degree as here um, um, such that um, my function is I'm, maybe I'm going to say m is equal to 1 so it's just going to be a function that's bounded by 1 and so I'm going to get that it's good, a good approximation <coughs> on f for f <coughs> for the region that's like <coughs> sorry for the region that's slightly outside of um, f <coughs> it's uh <coughs> <coughs> it's bounded and then finally uh on the rest of it, so I can extend it even further. Um, this is bounded by epsilon. Right, so here I'm imagining I have my inversion polynomial. And what I've done is I've re, I, I, in order to use this, I rescale so that um, my function is like, I, I sort of shift everything so that the region I want to approximate is in minus one, one. 
And then I can indeed get this approximation that's good on minus 1, 1. And then it's bounded in some region that's like delta size. And then it goes to 0, or it goes, it goes to near 0 very quickly after. And so using this tool a bunch of times, I can get um, approximations of um, sort of piecewise smooth functions. <coughs> um, and this is interesting because if you took a naive approximation, like a Chebyshev truncation of this polynomial, um, the Chebyshev approximation would approximate it well on minus 1, 1, but then it would like shoot off very quickly. Uh, and this is, uh, yeah, so Chebyshev uh, uh, truncations are generally very, very poor, uh, very poorly controlled outside of minus 1, 1. Um, and these are scaling as like x to the n, so it could be, you know, very large. Um, okay. And let me see. So I think I'm going to um, I think I'm not going to discuss the proof for time. Um, but basically, it, the idea is that you take your Chebyshev. Uh, you take this x to the e this, this bad scaling guy, and then you just uh, take this and then multiply by some function, some rectangle function that's um, that's one in the region minus one one, and then quickly drops down to zero um, here. And the idea is that if this is like, you can choose particular val particular sign functions, such that this guy is actually scaling like e to the minus x squared. Or um, that's like the way it's scaling, and then so it beats out the x to the n, and so so you multiply this by this um, error function, and then when you do that, you then do polynomial approximation again. Um, okay. <coughs> um, and using this, as I mentioned, how you do this before, you can get these approximations to um, to one over x. Notice that compared to what I was able to do before with, this, um, uh, with the standard theorem, the standard theorem was giving me something like um, this expression, which um, I said it before, but it's 1 over, when rho is 1 plus delta, it's like 1 over delta log. Um, when m is also a constant, it's like 1 over delta epsilon. 1 over delta log 1 over delta epsilon. And so if I'm, if I'm requiring this boundedness, I'm only losing this like factor of b, which is like the amount, um, how long I want to stay 0 for. Um, <coughs> and so using this, I can then conclude um, as a corollary, but it's like a, I guess it's a computationally heavy corollary. Um, that you can get some um, approximation of 1 over x. Here I'm scaling by delta so that my function is bounded between, so that my function is, uh, is rescaled to be size like norm 1. And then so I can say that there exists some odd polynomial p such that um, both I have that P is bounded, um, both that P is bounded in minus 1, 1, and also that uh, P is close to F on this region of delta 1, and because it's odd, it'll be, it'll be the same on minus 1 to minus delta. So this is how you might get like these polynomial approximations. Um, the final thing I wanted to discuss is lower bounds. So it's a question of how, how do you know that your, uh, 
your pol your polynomial is, is as good degree as you 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 can get. Um, and um, there's a couple of main things that I use as intuition for these polynomial approximation problems. Um, and they're these um, inequalities called, okay, there's one called the Markov uh, brothers inequality, um, which says that uh, if P is a polynomial that's degree N and P is bounded between minus one and one, um, then you have that the derivative of p is bounded by n squared in also in minus 1, 1. And there's another theorem called, I think it's like the uh, Bernstein um, inequality, which says that in the same setting, you get that the derivative is bounded by n over root 1 minus x squared. <clears throat> and so what this means is that if you have some polynomial approximation, um, between minus one and one, um, in like the region of like a constant, like uh, from like say like 0.9 to minus 0.9, in this region, your like derivative is, is bound, has to be bounded by uh, um, bounded by n, and then in this region it can it can be larger. It can be up to n squared. <coughs> and then so something that you can note is that, uh, for example, in the setting before, where I wanted to approximate delta over x on this bounded region, then what I wanted is I wanted some function. So if this was if, I want, if this was some of my approximation of delta over x, then I wanted something that here was minus 1 at um, minus delta, and here was uh, plus 1 at delta. So that's like some, my, what I want for my approximation. I can be epsilon off, but this, this is basically what I want for epsilon sufficiently small. And so by the mean value theorem, this means that there must be some value, some, some point in this interval with derivative that's like, uh, derivative, uh, like, omega of 1 over delta. Okay? So, from this you can conclude that any polynomial that approximates this delta over x sufficiently well needs to have a derivative of 1 over delta. And therefore, using this Bernstein inequality, you can conclude that it must have degree 1 over delta. Um, now, there's one more thing that I wanted to mention, sorry, um, which is that if, suppose that you were able to, th this sort of suggests that if I have some ill-conditioned part of my function, then it would be better if it was on the edge. And this turns out to be true, which is uh, that if you have some function, if you have your function and it looks like this, where it's like this, this happens near minus one. So for example, it could be like max minus one minus delta. Then the degree of approximation you can actually get is, uh, you can get quadratically better O of one over root delta. And this is the principle behind um, why sometimes you can get a quadratically be de better, better dependence on your condition number for positive definite matrices. Um, and in the lecture notes, I've linked to a reference that says that for a particular, if you're given a particular kind of block encoding um, for a positive definite matrix A, then you can get an algorithm that scales as root K, root kappa instead of kappa. Okay, that's it. Thanks.